Good morning and welcome to the Minneapolis Art Institute Cardiovascular Grand Rounds. I hope everybody is doing well. I know these are very uh, different circumstances, but I see that we have almost 30 participants, so that's really fantastic. I'm sure some more will join. It is my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Omer today to our Grand Rounds. He's our current Interventional Cardiology Fellow. These uh, fellows, um, they always do a fantastic job, but I think uh, in particular in this uh, current situation, I really have to give them a big round of applause because as you or many of you probably know, they had to stop their training for about four weeks because of uh, COVID-19. And then we now slowly introduce them back into the lab just simply uh, due to safety concerns. So. Uh, pretty rough times uh, for a trainee, I think, who is eager to start a new job soon. So a uh, big, big round of uh, applause. Uh, Dr. Omer joined us from uh, Egypt. He did basically his whole training uh, in Egypt, especially except for interventional cardiology, but he was a cardiology trainee. Came then uh, to the United States and at the uh, Mid-America Heart Institute, University of Missouri, Missouri, Kansas City, he did his residency and cardiology fellowship, then came to us and is uh, here completing his uh, interventional training. He is going to join a Mayo Clinic. Um, it's our second trainee who joins Mayo Clinic. Um, he is uh, very well published. Uh, you will see that he's also a great, great speaker, has great interest uh, in uh, multi-vessel disease, has worked with Banos uh, Brilakis here for a year now and before. And I'm uh, really pleased to introduce him. I'm. I'm always sad to have uh, people leave and soon uh, Omar and uh, Anene will leave us and they have done a fantastic job. So here's a complete revascularization in patients with multivessel coronary artery disease. Is the story complete? Um. Thank you very much, Dr. Gossel, for this nice introduction. And hello, everyone. Um, so today I'm talking. I'm going to talk about uh, complete revascularization uh, in patients with multivessel coronary artery disease. Is the story complete? Have no disclosure. Um, so. Uh, Dr. Omer, sorry to stop you. Actually, started by the Eureka moment. Yeah. Dr. Can Omer, can you share your can you share your screen, please? Yeah, so, sorry. So it's the green uh, share screen button on the bottom there. Yep. Thank you. Is it working now? It is, thank you. Perfect, thank you. So, um, thanks again, Dr. Gossel. So, um, today I'm gonna present complete revascularization in patients with multivessel coronary artery disease. Is the story complete? Uh, no disclosure. My mission to the IC world actually started by Eureka moment. So, as we uh, know, Archimedes, um, like many, many years ago, <laughs> uh, supposed to have his cry, Eureka, Eureka, he was jumping naked from the path and running in the street in um, Syracuse, excited by the discovery about this water displacement to solve a problem about the purity of gold crown. I had similar moment in my first year of uh, general cardiology in mid-America. Um, we had an urgent challenging case, the patient was non-STEMI, uh, with cardiogenic shock and multiple pressors. So we took him to the cath lab, I participated in the case, um, and then after complete revascularization, actually uh, the patient was um, uh, out of the cath lab without any pressure. We were able to win his uh, pressure immediately in the cath lab and he did a um, great job. Like, I mean, he was discharged from the hospital uh, in a short time. So this was my Eureka moment. I said like, this is what I'm gonna do because at this time I was undecided, should I go for intervention, heart failure, imaging? But at this time, I was like, this is, this is amazing. 
So um, I'm going to talk about three uh, subtopics. So I'm going to talk about value of complete revascularization in stable coronary artery disease uh, in patient with acute MI without cardiogenic shock and patient with acute MI with cardiogenic shock. So this is number one, patient with stable coronary artery disease. Uh, as we all know, patients undergoing PCI are often found to have multivessel coronary artery disease with one or more angiographically significant non-culprit non lesion. Um, however, there is uncertainty in how to best manage these non-culprit lesions. Should we just stent them all or just do uh, anatomical and stent only lesion with more than 70% or should we use functional assessment or just um, use medical treatment? We know medical treatment works sometimes. So uh, Dr. Gossel actually has a very nice um, literature review and a very nice paper in Circ Intervention in 2012, and he has all uh, this important question. Are there standard definition for uh, complete revascularization versus incomplete revascularization available? Uh, and then is complete revascularization is a fundamental tenant or just worthwhile uh, objective? And then should the complete revascularization become the standard for comparison of efficacy of different procedure? Uh, and do we, do we perform complete revascularization in those patients in whom we can and only perform incomplete when CR is not feasible? And has the famous study reframed the issue with regard to complete revascularization versus not? And finally, does it, the effect of complete revascularization depend mainly on the segment involved with like uh, LED if we just do complete revascularization? Uh, I mean, uh, complete vascularization is more important if we uh, did PCI to the LED. So these are all important questions. We'll try to answer some of that. So what's the prevalence? And complete vascularization actually is very common. This is from Centex trial in 2012. And as we can see, um, if you have more uh, multi-vessel disease, like left main and two vessel, actually 30% will have incomplete vascularization. However, if you have three vessel disease, it is probably 50% of the patient will have uh, incomplete vascularization. And it is actually unfortunately common with uh, PCI more than CAPH. This is also obvious uh, if we divide the patient by syntax uh, score. If we have a high syntax score, uh, like more than 33, 50% of the patient will have incomplete revascularization as well. This is a very important slide. So um, Farouk et al. in 2013, they published that the residual score, uh, residual syntax score more than eight after PCI was associated with a significant increase in five-year risk of death and comes uh, in point my own stroke. As you can see here, uh, if you have low syntax score, still, if you have residual score more than eight or you have a 23% increase in the estimated event rate. Um, similar if you have intermediate baseline or even high baseline with a residual score more than eight, which is red here, the red curve, has a very high um, risk of uh, death, MI, or stroke. We're going to talk about that later in the complete trial, about the importance of the residual syntax score. Um, Dr. Garcia and Dr. Perilak has also published this nice meta-analysis in Jack in 2013. Uh, they included 35 studies that compared complete revascularization versus incomplete revascularization. Roughly half of these patients received complete revascularization. Um, it is, as we said before, uh, usually incomplete revascularization was more common following PCI. Uh, the interesting results that complete revascularization was associated with lower long-term mortality as well as reduced MI and repeat uh, coronary revascularization. And interestingly, irrespective of revascularization modality, whether it is PCI or cabbage, mortality benefit was consistent across all the study. And the hazard ratio was, uh, or the risk ratio was 0.73, as we can see here in the uh, PCI. So it, complete revascularization was associated with lower long-term mortality. This was in 2013. There was a recent, actually, uh, more recent meta-analysis uh, about the same topic, and they found the same relative risk, 0.73, which was interesting about the beauty of science. I mean, this is a rep uh, reproducible result even uh, after three years uh, after the previous meta-analysis. However, they also found, this also, uh, Zimarano found an interesting study that more, the more recent study actually has more weight and 
in reduction of myocardial infarction. So they said relative risk reduction of myocardial infarction obtained with complete revascularization seems stronger in the recent study and in population with high prevalence of diabetes. As you can see, the white uh, circle here or the blank circle is the PCI and the black is the cabbage. So as we move toward more recent year, we have uh, better reduction in myocardial infarction. And also we have better reduction in myocardial infarction with high risk patient like when the diabetes is more prevalent. Uh, this was an interesting study published in New England um, from observational uh, registry in the New York registry. The old compared cabbage uh, to PCI using new generation drug eluting stent. So it included almost 35,000 patients, uh, almost 16,000 underwent isolated cabbage, and 17, almost 18,000 underwent PCI with a virulomous drug eluting stent. And then they did propensity matching analysis to uh, compare the outcome between. Uh, more homogeneous cohort. What did they find? Uh, at meaningful up of three years, compared with cabbage, BCI was actually associated with a uh, similar risk of death. However, higher risk of MI. So this is a MI group here. Uh, as you can see, PCI has a higher risk of MI, uh, repeat revascularization, but lower risk of stroke. So why higher risk of MI? Uh, they tried to do sub uh, group analysis, and what was found was among the matched pairs, the patient who underwent like propensity matching analysis, the higher risk of MI with PCI versus cabbage was significant only among those who uh, underwent incomplete revascularization. As we can see here, the relative risk is 1.66 only in incomplete revascularization. However, with complete revascularization, uh, the hazard ratio is almost one. So this was uh, very interesting. Um, the second question, does functional complete revascularization matter? So this was a nice study um, by Dr. Cruz. And so they included 200 stable patients referred through Korean geography, and they did routine FFR in every uh, patent vessel. And what they found was lesion graded more than 70%. The FFR was uh, less than 0.8, which is positive, and only 53 of patient, this group here. So this means that 47% of the stenosis graded more than 70, uh, by angiography or by our eyes, the FFR indicated that there was no physiologically significant lesion. And this has important ramification, actually, um, because as you can see here, almost also uh, a third of patient um, was uh, intermediate lesion uh, will have uh, positive FFR. So what's the gold standard? So. Dr. Cicero really tried to answer this question. So they uh, include uh, almost a thousand lesions from 600 medically treated patients in the FAME2 trial. And what they did was they divided all these stenosis according to four groups, according to the FFR and diameter of stenosis. The group one was the highest risk, which is um, positive concordance, which means FFR positive and diameter of stenosis more than 50%. And then negative concordance, which is the lowest risk, I mean, by our experience, negative FFR and diameter stenosis less than 50. And then these two interesting group, which is positive mismatch, uh, positive FFR, but diameter stenosis is less than 50. And finally, uh, negative mismatch. Um, what did they find? So they found that um, regardless of diameter stenosis, if you have FFR more than 0.8, you have a better uh, outcomes at uh, almost 600 days. The outcome was death, myocardial infarction, and revascularization. So if you have negative, if the patient has negative FFR, regardless of the diameter of stenosis, if it is less than 50 or more than 50, the outcome is better. However, if you have positive FFR, less than 0.8, um, you have, the patient will have worse outcome. So they recommended actually that measurement of FFR should no longer be limited to angiographically intermediate stenosis, but should be contemplated in stenosis that are mild or severe by visual evaluation. So this was a reminder to all of us that um, if you all you have is a hammer, which is uh, our visual eye assessment or the um, angiography, everything looks like a nail. So we should use uh, all the tools that we have. And uh, I think IFR or FFR should be the gold standard. The first trial also should 
interesting results. Like they, uh, for after 15 years of follow-up, they found that the risk of MI was actually lower in patient um, which were deferred, which uh, safely deferred by negative uh, FFR. The rate of MI was significantly lower in the deferred group, 2.2 versus 10%, with a relative risk of 0.2. And this, this was not, uh, there was no signs of late catch up, which means, oh, I'm gonna defer this lesion now, but probably he's gonna, the patient will need the revascularization later on. Actually, this was not true. There was no signs of late catch up because the revascularization was similar in the fewer and perform group. Similarly, in the FIM2 trial, the five year follow up, they found that the five year rate for spontaneous MI in 800 patients with ischemic FFR value. Uh, there was a strong signal toward less MI in the PCI group. So here, the PCI was performed appropriately uh, by uh, ischemic FFR. So if, if we do the PCI appropriately in a, in a lesion that is ischemic, then we find um, that this is, uh, can reduce the uh, myocardial infarction in the future. And this was actually also in the ischemia trial, Dr. Brownwald mentioned there was this signal um, of spontaneous MI reduction in the ischemia trial after four years uh, of follow-up, but uh, we need to extend this follow-up in the ischemia trial to, uh, to see if this is significantly uh, different. And this was um, another meta-analysis of FFR guided PCI. Uh, so Zimmerman has included the results of FAME2 trial, the NAMI uh, trial, and COMPARE ACUTE. And, um, they found three years, the complete endpoint of cardiac death MI was observed with FFR. Uh, there was a significant difference in uh, the cumulative incidence of cardiac death or MI with FFR guided PCI compared to medical therapy. Hazard ratio of 0.72, uh, and this was highly significant. And the difference was again driven mainly by reduction in spontaneous MI. This was a recently published uh, article in Jack this year uh, from the VA hospital, 66 VA hospital in the US. Um, they uh, tracked almost 18,000 staple patients and they uh, divided them into two groups. However, the patient underwent angiography only or FFR guided uh, PCI. And then the one year mortality was actually 2.8 in the FFR group versus uh, almost 6% in the angiography only group. So uh, they did further multivariate adjustment, and they found that uh, FFR guided revascularization was associated again with lower risk of um, my, uh, as a composite endpoint uh, with a hazard ratio of almost 0.57. Very impressive. Uh, this is another concept we, we talked about previously: the residual syntax score. Um, uh, Again, more than eight associated with a very high uh, estimated event rate. And then what if we uh, do like um, residual syntax score after functionally complete revascularization? Let's say we revascularize the LED and uh, CERC based on IFR, and then there is some lesion in the RCA. Does this still count? Actually, no. If we do complete functional revascularization, any residual syntax score does not have any impact on survival. So this was a nice paper in Jack, uh, and then similarly, uh, if you if if we actually leave a functional uh, incomplete revascularization, this actually has a very high uh, risk in the future. Uh, as you can see, a two year of uh, this this study included almost 400 patients underwent three vessel FFR and PCI functional complete revascularization, which was defined as a residual functional syntax score less than one was compared with functionally complete revascularization. So what did they find? That complete revascularization here in blue has much better uh, outcomes than uh, functional incomplete revascularization. And it actually also, uh, this is a residual fun functional syntax score. This is the red one, has the best uh, discriminative value for uh, prediction of outcomes uh, was uh, C index of 0.7. Uh, so this is much better than uh, the anatomical syntax score and much better than doing just three vessel FFR. This was also published recently in Jack Intervention. So residual functional uh, syntax score was the best uh, predictive model for uh, MACE. 
So not surprisingly, I mean, the EC guideline that um, upgraded this uh, or mentioned uh, that it is a class 1A to perform FFR or IFR when there is no evidence of ischemia uh, to assess the hemodynamic relevance of intermediate grade stenosis. And then they also mentioned that it is class 2AB to do FFR guided PCI in all patients with multivessel disease undergoing PCI. Is the story complete in patients with stable contrary disease? Actually, no. Uh, the FEMS3 trial is uh, being conducted now. Uh, they are trying to compare the functional assessment or functional revascularization. They will do FFR. Uh, so they will have all patients with three vessel disease and then a heart team discussion. Um, and then they will randomize patients either to PCI with resolute drug luting stent after doing uh, FFR to all vessel. And then they will stent all the lesions that is FFR less than 0.8, uh, and then perform cabbage based on the coronary angio without doing FFR. And then they will follow the outcome uh, after one year, death, MI, CVA, or, or revascularization. So this will be the first randomized trial to compare uh, anatomical, uh, based, uh, anatomical uh, revascularization based on cabbage versus uh, functional, comp uh, functional complete revascularization based on coronary angio. Uh, based on FFR with PCI. So this would be a very interesting study to watch. And then this was a, also a nice st uh, p um, slide from Dr. Morton Kern uh, about things that we need to work on. Like uh, we know from stable coronary heart disease is FFR and uh, non-hyperemic uh, index like IFR, it is both validated, validated in stable coronary heart disease, but we don't know about uh, the IFR in STEMI, SBG assessment, osteolesion bypass. So any research fellow or uh, general fellow can try to work on these uh, topics. But this is um, a gap of evidence so far. So conclusion for this part, anatomic revascularization is associated with improved outcome after PCI. Um, and then anatomic complete revascularization with PCI compared favorably with cabbage. And functional complete revascularization is actually even resulting in better outcome than uh, just anatomical complete revascularization. And we are waiting for the results of the FIM3 trial in the next few years. The second topic is uh, a value of complete revascularization in acute MI without cardiogenic shock. So in this topic, I'm gonna focus on um, the complete trial that was published recently because it is the largest trial so far and it is randomized. Um, so why this trial was conducted? Because um, as we as we all know, so like with a STEMI patient, almost there are 50% will have multivessel disease. Uh, there is uncertainty in how to manage this patient. Just should we uh, routinely revascularize all of them, or should we just manage them conservatively? There were like multiple prior RCT, and they showed that PCI for non-culprit lesion actually reduced revascularization, which is expected, but none of this trial was powered enough to detect moderate reduction in hard clinical outcome. Meta-analysis suggested there is a possible, there is a signal again of reduction of cardiovascular death in MI, but the result was very uh, weak. Uh, that's why the complete trial was designed to address this evidence gap. These are the prior trial. As we can see, the sample size was um, less than a thousand in each one of these. And, uh, also, the design was different. Some of them performed complete revascularization during index. Some of them, they decided to do it staged, and some of them index or staged. So the primary objective was that for the complete trial was to de determine whether a strategy of routine staged non-culprit lesion PCI with a goal of complete revascularization is superior to a strategy of just culprit vessel only PCI and reducing the hard outcomes, which is composite of CVDS or NMI. This was uh, designed, so uh, included all STEMI with multivessel disease and successful PCI. Uh, multivessel disease was divided at at least one additional non culprit lesion, more than 2.5 diameter, and more than 70% stenosis. And then they used FFR if the lesion is borderline, which is like 50 to 70. But they said this was uh, very infrequent. Um, so uh, the, ex the main exclusion was cardiogenic shock. And then they asked actually the operator uh, before randomization, are you planning to do this complete revascularization during index or after three weeks from discharge? And then after 
determination of this uh, intent of the operator, they randomize the patient to either complete revascularization or culprit lesion only revascularization. So we ended up with almost two um, two thousand group two thousand patients in each arm, uh, and then they uh, decided to do maximum medical directed therapy for each uh, group. The main follow up was three years. Uh, this was uh, multinational, as you can see, uh, all over the world. Uh, the study was very well powered uh, to detect hard outcome, as we said. This is the baseline characteristic. Um, it is well balanced between the two arms. Uh, and then I think we need to focus on this part here. So non-culprit lesion specific, which is, uh, let's say, the anterior STEMI and then um, LAD you treated with a culprit vessel PCI. Let's say there is a CERC lesion. So this is a non-culprit lesion specific syntax score. So the mean syntax score in the non-culprit vessel was 4.5, which means these are simple uh, non-complex lesion. Because if you add like CTO or like bifurcation, the syntax score would go up. So they tried to revascularize the symbol that's not complex, like non-CTO lesion. Uh, and then they achieved actually complete revascularization in 90% in the complete arm. So this was very impressive. The syntax score, the residual syntax score after uh, complete revascularization was zero. So when you have a well-designed study, you find a beautiful results like this. So the first core primary, outcome, which is CVDS or NeoMI, um, was much lower in the complete arm, which is the blue, arm, uh, blue curve here. So the hazard ratio is 0.74, uh, highly significant p-value, with a number needed to treat it 37. This is actually similar to the statin uh, benefit. And then if you add ischemia-driven revascularization, the hazard ratio is almost 0.5, which is 50% reduction in hazard uh, ratio with a number needed to treat only 13. Efficacy outcome, again, the signal that we saw before in complete, uh, in the stable coronary disease, we find a similar signal. Uh, there is MI uh, reduction in the complete revascularization in the future. It's, as you can see, it is 1.5, 1. 1. Um, uh, 5.4 versus 7.9. And they uh, specifically said this was type one, which is a spontaneous MI almost a 50% reduction in the hazard ratio. And then the second question they try to answer, should we do it staged or uh, should we do it during the index hospitalization? And as we remember, it was uh, this was uh, stratification before randomization. So they ended up with uh, 2,000 patients, 2,700 actually underwent um, index hospitalization versus 1,400 in the after discharge. Uh, again, the characteristics were very well balanced between the two groups. Uh, and again, the 100% occlusion, which is CTO, was very infrequent, only 1% in both arms. Uh, there was no difference. So the p-value for interaction was 0 0.6, which means you have benefits of complete revascularization. Either you, uh, the operator decided to perform the complete revascularization during index or after discharge, similar uh, hazard ratio, 0.7. And the same for the second co-primary outcome, 0.5 and 0.6. B-value for interaction was not significant. And then they tried to answer this question, like is the benefit of uh, complete revascularization, is it early or is it after 45 days? Actually, they found it is mainly after 45 days. So the, during the first 45 days, the hazard ratio was 0.8, but the confidence interval was not significant. But after 45 days, we can see that the curves tried, uh, are widely uh, divergent. So the benefit is mainly after 45 days. And then they did this uh, cumulative outcome difference. And as we can see, this is the first co-primary outcome, which is CVDS or MI. The uh, benefit increase over a year. And if you add ischemia-driven revascularization, the benefit is even much better. So the conclusion in this subtopic, in patients with STEMI and multivessel coronary disease, compared with a culprit lesion only PCI, routine revascularization with a goal of complete revascularization, again, residual syntax score of zero, resulted in reduced cardiovascular death or NEOMI by 26%, and reduced CV death, NEOMI, or ischemia-driven revascularization by almost 50%. 
and the benefit of complete repascularization was similar in, in those undergoing non culvert during the index or after discharge. Uh, the benefit mainly emerged over long term after 45 days. And importantly, there was no significant difference in bleeding, uh, stent thrombosis, acute kidney injury, or a stroke. The third topic, which is more challenging, is the value of complete revascularization in acute MI with cardiogenic shock. So uh, Dr. Uh, Hargerfield presented some of these slides in uh, TCT in 2019. He asked the panel this question. You have this anterior patient, uh, this patient with an anterior STEMI. The LED is totally occluded, as you can see here. And then the CERC, you have a significant lesion. And then uh, the RCA is totally occluded. This was actually one of the culprit shock trial. How would you decide how, which vessel are gonna revascularize? So there are four options. You can do culprit lesion only, or we can do culprit lesion plus stage revascularization, or we can do primary cabbage or immediate multivessel PCI. So uh, the only thing we know that can improve outcome in cardiogenic shock is early revascularization. And this is what we know from the shock trial. Um, we know also that the incidence of multivessel coronary disease in cardiogenic shock is actually much higher. Almost 75% um, at least will have multivessel coronary disease. And uh, multivessel PCI in cardiogenic shock has different uh, grades. Like before the culprit shock, it was 2A in the European guideline. And it was appropriate according to the appropriate use criteria from the US guideline in uh, 2016. Um, then uh, there was a meta-analysis, a different meta-analysis actually. So there was one published in 2017, they found that short-term mortality based on observation didn't show any difference uh, with multivessel versus complete revascularization. Long-term mortality was also uh, not different. So this was meta-analysis before the culprit shock trial. Interestingly, another meta-analysis in 2018, which included a 10 study found 37% uh, short-term mortality uh, in patient undergoing multivessel PCI. So this meta-analysis found that multivessel PCI was actually uh, harmful, but long-term mortality was similar between the two arms. So what was the hypothesis of the culprit shock trial? They tried to compare culprit lesion only PCI with possible stage revascularization um, to, uh, they try to test the hypothesis that this is superior to immediate multivessel PCI in patients with cardiogenic shock and multivessel coronary disease. Uh, the primary outcome was a composite of all cause mortality or renal replacement therapy at 30 days. This was mainly a European trial, included um, many European countries, as we can see. Um, and this was the design. Very important to see here uh, 700 patients randomized to 350 in each arm. Uh, this one is uh, culprit vessel plus staged versus immediate multivessel. This is a little bit uh, one of the problem with the trial is a high rate of crossover. So as you can see here, at least 13% immediately crossed to uh, immediate multivessel from the culprit vessel only. Uh, and then 60, 60 patients actually underwent staged PCI within the same hospitalization. Why this is important? Because as you can see, why this reason, why this patient uh, crossed to the other arm? They, this is uh, in the like supplement or the supplementary table. This, oh, this patient, patient with progression of hemodynamic deterioration. So the operator decided, oh, I'm gonna plan to do complete revascularization. So this patient went from culprit vessel to immediate vessel, multi-vessel. And this patient, massive cardiogenic shock. And then this one was the most interesting for me, life-saving step to achieve better perfusion under ECLS therapy. So he considered immediate multivessel PCI a life-saving step and decided to take this patient out of the uh, culprit vessel to the multivessel. So totally 43 patients crossed over from the culprit lesion to multivessel for reason including lack of hemodynamic improvement, new lesion or plaque shift. This is uh, leading to a bias toward adding more complex and more complicated vision to the multivessel PCI. And this has probably led to overestimation of the benefit of the culprit lesion only because now it is including less risky patient. The baseline characteristic was similar in uh, both arms. Um, it was a high rate of uh, resuscitation before randomization, which means cardiac arrest. 50% of the patient in both arms had a cardiac arrest, which is really high. Uh, STEMI was 60% in the whole cohort. 
And then as we expected, three vessel disease was very common, almost two thirds of the patient. And this was another important point. CTO was very common as well, almost 22 in the culprit only PCI and in the multi-vessel PCI almost uh, 25%. And per protocol, the operator are, uh, obli uh, are, the operator are required to perform CTO PCI in the multi-vessel PCI only. Uh, femoral axis was common, 80%. Um, they used drug eluting stent and um, MCS, actually, mechanical circulatory support was also very low in this study, only 30%, which is uncommon in the US. Uh, mechanical ventilation was very high, 80%. And this is the results. So the primary study endpoint, uh, which is, uh, as we said previously, 30 day uh, all cause mortality or renal replacement therapy was uh, significantly higher in the immediate multi-vessel PCI versus the culprit vessel. So 55 versus 45. And this was driven mainly by increase in mortality, almost 8% in the immediate multi-vessel PCI. There was no difference in the subgroup. And this led to a uh, downgrade of the recommendation actually to a class 3B in the European guideline to do immediate multi-vessel PCI in patients with cardiogenic shock. Um, and then they did uh, publish uh, uh, the one year outcome in the New England Journal the next year in 2018. And they found similarly, um, if you add mortality or renal replacement therapy, uh, the relative risk is 0.87. But if you consider only all cause mortality, it is actually non significant. So the one year mortality was similar between the two groups. So uh, they try to compare, like, are these different animals? Why, 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 why the, the results are completely different from the complete trial? And actually, the design is very different. So in the complete trial that we discussed previously, it was a culprit lesion only versus a culprit lesion plus uh, stage three vascularization. However, in the culprit shock trial, it was a culprit lesion plus stage three vascularization in a comparison with immediate multivessel PCI. So the uh, design is a little bit or completely different uh, in, in, uh, in, in both trials. And as we expected, the one-year repeat revascularization uh, was a very high in the culprit lesion only PCI. So this is a late catch-up phenomena that we discussed before. So um, Dr. Uh, Thiel recommended that if you have a patient with cardiogenic shock, you should do culprit lesion only plus the stage revascularization and you should try to avoid immediate multivessel PCI unless uh, there is no identifiable culprit lesion or there are more than one culprit lesion or there is a high grade uh, lesion with reduced flow like subtotal LED lesion. These are, uh, were not addressed in the culprit shock and uh, every operator should think about this uh, exception uh, on individual basis. Are we done yet? So the last part of my presentation will talk about my uh, project with Dr. Prelakis and Dr. John Spertus. We published a abstract in the TCT last year and we are going to submit the manuscript hopefully uh, this month. So this was uh, NCDR uh, study um, from the CAF PCI registry. The background was that we all know that multivessel PCI improve perfusion of the very infarct area, which can improve LV function. Additionally, multivessel PCI can prevent recurrent ischemia in the uh, non infarcted related lesion. However, there are some costs for that. I mean, we know that if you do multivessel PCI, you will have more contrast use, will have increased thrombogenicity, and increase the procedural time. So, our objective was number one, describe the frequency of multivessel PCI in patients with non STEMI only presenting with cardiogenic shock, and then describe the short and long term outcome of uh, these two strategy, immediate multivessel PCI versus immediate culprit vessel. The data source, as we all know, the NCDR is a well-known registry, uh, collect data from more than a thousand sites across the US. Um, and then we also were able to obtain long-term data through uh, the linkage between uh, CAF PCI and the Medicare, but this was only available for patients between 2009 and 2013. We were able to get like seven year mortality data. Uh, based on the revascularization strategy, we uh, divided the cohort into multivessel PCI versus uh, culprit vessel. 
this was a, a flow chart. Uh, we almost included 25,000, 15,000 in the culprit vessel versus 10,000 in the multi-vessel PCI. And then we decided to perform a propensity score analysis to uh, have a, a homogeneous cohort in each arm. So we ended up with almost um, uh, 7,800 in each arm. Primary outcome was the occurrence of procedural complication, including in hospital mortality, bleeding event, requirement for blood transfusion, stroke, or requirement of dialysis, and pericardial tamponade. The secondary outcome was a seven year old cause mortality. Um, as I said before, we conducted a pre specified propensity score analysis uh, to adjust for the baseline differences in the two arms. These are the factors that were entered in the model. Uh, we try to adjust for everything possible, uh, including age, sex, insurance, uh, clinical risk factor, year of PCI, because we included from uh, like 2008 till 2017 or 2018, so this was like almost 10 year, and there was a recent development in PCI technique in the last few years. Uh, disease severity, um, pre-PCI procedure complication, especially mechanical uh, support device, and uh, two P3A because it was common in the previous year. And then the lesion characteristic, uh, we adjusted for left main disease and lesion complexity, which is class C. Uh, we performed one-to-one -one, uh, propensity matching analysis with a caliber of 0.2. And uh, we considered a standardized difference less than 10% as acceptable. Uh, and then we performed conditional logistic regression to uh, produce odds ratio and 95 confidence interval. And finally, for the long-term analysis, we performed Cox proportional hazard uh, analysis. This was the first objective, which is a trend of multi-vessel PCI over time. As you can see, actually it increased from almost 35% to 45% uh, across the year. And this was a um, statistically significant increase. Uh, Dr. Rupert and uh, his colleague also published similar data from in the ACC this year, but uh, in the STEMI population, and they try to explain why is this increase happening on the multi-vessel PCI. As you can see, initially there was a flat curve because the guideline was against that. But then after the randomized trial, uh, like PRAMI and CV culprit and then DNAMI, all of them should benefit of multi-vessel PCI. Then the curve or the, of the frequency of multi-vessel PCI is starting to increase. It will be very interesting to see this end at like 2017. So the culprit shock was published at this time. So would be interesting to see if this curve will remain increasing or will uh, decrease. This is our table one or baseline characteristic. Uh, so it's busy slide, but as you can see here, if you focus, the only difference is prior cabbage, which makes sense. Like if a patient has a prior cabbage, it is unlikely to undergo multivessel PCI. These patients usually have CTOs. Uh, so um, culprit vessel only was common in patient with prior cabbage. However, we enter this in our model. So after propensity matching analysis, as you can see here, the standardized difference is less than uh, 10 in everything. Uh, um, cardiac arrest, as you can see, it's very different than the culprit shock trial. They, they had 50% patients with cardiac arrest. However, in our study, it's only uh, 25%. And as expected, the contrast volume and fluoroscopy time was much higher in the multivessel PCI. Contrast was 230 versus 180, and fluoroscopy time was 25 versus 19. Uh, the major difference is, again, we adjusted for left main disease. However, the multivessel PCI actually has more high risk feature, like left main PCI was common in multivessel PCI as expected, and LED intervention, uh, RCA, CERC were all more common in the multivessel because this, this uh, arm, I mean, this arm has, um, uh, try to revascularize everything while this arm is only culprit vessel only PCI. And importantly, the CTO PCI was only 9.5 in the multi vessel PCI. If you compare this to the culprit shock, it was 25%. So, uh, very significant difference in, uh, in the CTO PCI. What is the outcome? The outcome actually was very interesting. So, the in hospital mortality after propensity matching was lower in the multi-vessel PCI, 30% versus 34%, and it was highly significant uh, p-value. But this was at the cost of increasing uh, bleeding event, 
and uh, near requirement for dialysis. But still, it was like 5.7 requirement for dialysis versus 4.5. If you, if you compare this to the culprit shock trial, it actually it was like 16% uh, new requirement for dialysis in the culprit shock versus 11%. So they have a higher incidence of uh, requirement for dialysis. And probably this is because, because of the more contrast used because of the uh, CTO-PCI in the setting of cardiogenic shock. Um, there is no difference. There was no difference in tamponade or stroke between both arms. We performed subgroup analysis as well, and we found that multivessel PCI reduced mortality in all the subgroup. But it was uh, there was a p-value significant for interaction in the mechanical circulatory support, which means that uh, multivessel PCI even reduced the mortality much uh, better in patients with uh, mechanical circulatory support. And the culprit shock, as we can, uh, as we remember, the mechanical circulatory support was only used in 30% in the culprit shock trial. In our uh, NCDR database, it was used almost 60%. And then the Cox proportional hazard uh, showed similar hazard ratio, almost the curve are identical, which was similar to the culprit shock. As we remember, to one year was not different between the two arms. Uh, so why our results are different? Uh, I think the design is different. So we are comparing here multi-vessel PCI to culprit vessel only. Uh, however, culprit shock, they added staged revascularization to the culprit only PCI. Uh, the staged PCI was only less than 5% in both group in our arm. Uh, but if in the culprit shock, it was 30%. So in the culprit only PCI, in the culprit shock, 30% in the culprit only underwent multi immediate multi-vessel PCI. So this was a little bit confusing. Are we comparing uh, apple to apple here or not? Uh, and then the second op the second uh, point why our results are different are, is that we included only non-STEMI patient. However, in the culprit shock trial, they included STEMI, which was 60% and non-STEMI. And we know from previous trials that non-STEMI and STEMI uh, have different outcomes. Uh, also, there were a lot of differences in the patient characteristics, as I mentioned before. 25% of our patients had cardiac arrest, uh, and MCS use or mechanical circulatory support was um, much higher in our study. Finally, the CTO PCI was attempted in the multi vessel PCI in the culprit shock. 23% of patients had uh, CTO PCI, uh, however, it was only 9.5 in our group. This probably um, led to the less contrast load in our study and less requirement for dialysis, which probably can affect uh, the outcome. Finally, uh, according to the culprit shock trial, in patient with multivessel coronary artery disease and cardiogenic shock, which includes STEMI and non-STEMI, culprit lesion only PCI with possible staged revascularization reduced short-term mortality at 30 days. However, the one-year mortality was similar. Uh, the US registry, the NCDR, uh, our study showed that 40% uh, of non-STEMI patients are treated with multi-vessel PCI in the United States, and this strategy was associated with lower adjusted in-hospital mortality, uh, but similar long-term survival uh, compared with culprit vessel only. And I think we still need further well-designed uh, randomized trial to address this question. Thank you so much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Omer. I have, um, when, whenever this topic comes up and you pointed out this one paper that I actually wrote as a fellow, it is a very complex topic. I think that it is just not easy to answer. I think our initial thought is always to do everything we can. Exactly. Uh, I don't know if that's really true in every patient, but um, there's a lot of questions actually already uh, while you were talking, lots of interest, and uh, maybe we should go to those questions. and. Um, see if we can answer them. Uh, one of the questions is, this is uh, anonymous, so I can't uh, um, tell you who asked the question, but it's, uh, can you comment on use of PCI complete revascularization as treatment for ischemia-mediated left ventricular dysfunction? Ischemia-mediated uh, left ventricular dysfunction? Yeah, if you look at the uh, q and A, I think it's on your screen too, the questions are under Q and A. Oh. Just in the bottom of the screen, just in case you want to, you know, read them as well. Yeah, it'll be sure. Um, 
just in the lower, lower part where you see participants and then Q&A is the next. Participant, yeah, I, I'm clicking on um, Q&A, but um, for some reason, I'll try it again. Yeah, I, I, you click on that, and but I can't see. Oh, here you go. Yes. You can got you it? On use, yes. Uh, can you comment on use of PCI complete vascularization as treatment for ischemia mediated uh, left ventricular dysfunction? Um, okay. The question is like in which setting? Because as we, as we we saw from the like presentation that patient with cardiogenic shock, for example, have left ventricular dysfunction. Uh, the culprit shock trial, the EF, uh, was almost 30 to 35 percent. And also in our study in the NCDR, the uh, av the mean left ventricular function was also 35 percent. So if the um, left, uh, left ventricular dysfunction was ischemia mediated in the setting of cardiogenic shock, uh, I think we have to think about culprit vessel only plus stage revascularization according to the culprit shock. Um, but if it is um, STEMI, uh, with no cardiogenic shock, I think uh, uh, like complete revascularization will um, produce better results. So it okay. all depends on the setting, yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you see the second question? Yeah. yeah. Can you can you comment comment on PCI complete revascularization in the context of uh, the ischemia and um, courage trial finding? Um, that's an important question. Uh, ischemia trial actually tried to address a very uh, different hypothesis. So their hypothesis was uh, is uh, like um, medical treatment versus uh, PCI in patient with uh, high risk stress finding. So um, I don't think the uh, I tried to I mean try to incorporate the ischemia trial in my presentation, but I I couldn't because the design is very different. They didn't. Add incomplete versus complete revascularization. So um, uh, I don't think I can like relate the two studies together. And then uh, the benefit of complete revascularization seemed to be at odds with recent study published by the ischemia showing no outcome difference between an initial invasive versus initial conservative. Do you think that if more patients had a complete revascularization, this outcome would be different? Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. Yes, I think if if we, uh, as I mentioned before, like Dr. Brownwald uh, wrote a brilliant editorial in New England in March about the ischemia trial. He mentioned this risk, like uh, with uh, PCI, there is a higher initial risk with per-procedure MI. Uh, however, after four years of follow-up, there is a reduction in the spontaneous MI. I can show you the curve there. They are actually divergent uh, uh, over the years, and actually the curves are in, uh, continue to diverge. So that's why he recommended that this trial should not be stopped. I mean, the ischemia trial, especially the follow up of this patient, as we can see the signal. So I think uh, from the ischemia trial, there is evidence of um, reduction in spontaneous MI with uh, PCI. The main difference between your study and the shock trial is probably the presence of STEMI. That's a good point. Has an analysis of the shock trial. Uh, looking only at non STEMI has been done. I don't think so. Yeah, I, I, I agree. This was a huge difference in our study and the culprit shock because we included only exclusively non STEMI and the culprit shock um, included both. But I think they did subgroup analysis and the interaction was non significant. So I don't think they did, they did separately like a paper for STEMI, non STEMI, but they mentioned this in their for, first plot the P interaction for STEMI versus non STEMI was. Uh, non-significant. But I think another major point, uh, which as I mentioned, the CTO-PCI was a uh, big difference. And I don't know why they uh, mandated that every patient with uh, cardiogenic shock should undergo CTO-PCI in this setting, because we know from the Explore trial that uh, CTO-PCI did not improve the left ventricular ejection fraction in the setting of STEMI and cardiogenic shock. So this was uh, one of the major criticism of this trial. And also we saw the difference in the complete trial. They required the patient, as the operator go or chase the like medium complex lesion or simple complex, simple complex lesion, not the syntax, the mean syntax score was four in the non-culprit uh, vessel. Mm -hmm. 
I don't see uh, another question here on our Q&A. Um, I'm assuming that uh, we won't get any more, but you had uh, great attendance here. Uh, I think over 60. You did a fantastic job. Thank you. Uh, you got a, got a compliment here by text message to me. You know, someone said that you had a, an amazing knowledge of uh, the field and very impressive. Thank you, sir. So um, very complex topic. Um, and congratulations to your work here. Congratulations to your successes here during the fellowship. Uh, congratulations to your new job that you're going to start soon. Um, yes, sir. I told them I want to start July 1st, but they said, nope, you have to go for orientation. So uh, I'm going to start uh, July 6th. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, <laughs> it's important. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. Uh, any other things that we can do from the, from the panel? Um, if, if there's no more questions, I, th I, th I think that's it. So if you guys have any closing remarks, uh, feel free. Up to you, Dr. Omer. Yeah, my closing remark, uh, I will uh, update you about our um, manuscript. It is almost done now and uh, I will keep you updated. I think it will um, have uh, a good impact. And I think we should also uh, think about this patient uh, on individual basis. As Dr. Uh, Thiel mentioned that if you have, let's say, inferior STEMI, and uh, we were able to fix uh, the RCA, but the patient is in cardiogenic shock and you have subtotal LED, we should not be discouraged um, to try to fix the subtotal LED uh, as long as uh, we didn't ex exceed the contrast load. Uh, we did not, it is not like a complex CTO. So he mentions this is specifically, like if you have uh, persistent, um, like hemodynamic significance and you have a subtotal lesion in a non-culprit vessel, it, it, this should be considered uh, on individual basis, but it should not be like contraindication. Good, I think you answered uh, Dr. Burke's question there. Good, well, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you, Dr. Omer for uh, presenting and thank you, Dr. Gessel for joining us as well. Uh, just one quick announcement is uh, we will be sending out our twice a year eval this week. Uh, your feedback is really important to us. Uh, so please take a few minutes to let us know uh, what your thoughts are on Grand Rounds uh, thus far. Next week will be our last session of the spring. Uh, so please join us to hear from Drs. Moore, uh, Gessel, and Skake on anticoagulation and antiplatelet agents. We really, we really look forward to that presentation. Uh, and with that, thank you and have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.